Arcus, 9966. I've discovered more stories by Bara that feature an esoteric character called the Prisoner. Like the other stories, the Prisoner is trapped in a dark and strange dimension from which he is desperately trying to escape. Bara's stories, especially the ones written later on in his career, focus heavily on this dimension which he calls the Horror. He describes it as the dimension where all horror originates. An interesting idea, but flawed in so many ways. Arcus, 9967. The prisoner can experience memories and stories extracted from a fog-like substance. After years of searching for a way out, he finds the answers he's looking for in the recorded memories found amidst the ruins of a castle. The memories are captured on an old vinyl record, which he plays on a gramophone in front of a wall of crazy. He listens to the scratchy record, and soon discovers that the way out is through the darkest and most dangerous place in the horror. The Void. I've read about the Void in the works of several authors now. Some believe it contains a way out. Others believe it's all a trick. A trick to get the prisoner to jump out of the frying pan and into the fire. I'm not sure which stories to believe. It could be that all versions are true in some way. Perhaps there is a way out for those who know how to find it, but for those who don't, the void ends up being a place of greater suffering and torment. It's hard to know which story or stories to trust. Arcus, 9968. I'm still missing critical parts to the story and I'm not exactly sure if there's anything to be learned by the prisoner's journey through the void. If, in the very least, I knew the prisoner had escaped, that would be something. That would give me the impetus to act. But as it stands, I'm still not sure how the story ends. Arcus, 9969. There is no such thing as fiction. Everything is based on some reality somewhere. Arcus, 9970. I found a series by Bara called Tales from the Horror. Hundreds of stories about people trapped in the horror, most of them trying to escape, others acting as servants of the darkness. I found one story detailing how an unlikely squad of survivors created an opening into the void with a sequence of symbols discovered on a scroll. They carved the symbols into a strange growth so that it exploded and destabilized the realms, creating a small rupture into the void. There must be a version of this story where the symbols are described in greater detail. If I could somehow discover the correct sequence, I would have most of what I need to attempt an escape. I am close now closer than I've ever been. It's hard to believe I've made it this far. The Magnificent Maurice, one. They call me Maurice. The Magnificent Maurice. Mr. Shelby, the farmer, started calling me Magnificent soon after I was born. Not because I'm special or spectacular or anything like that, but because he thought I was weak and scrawny and good for nothing like a cart without wheels. For some reason he swore to his wife that I was cursed, and that bad things had been happening to him and his farm ever since I arrived. He figured if he called me magnificent, he'd trick some buckethead into buying me at the country fair. I remember figuring I was different than the other colts, not because I made bad things happen, but because I could make things happen and I could make things happen just by thinking about them. I didn't realize it at first, but anyone who showed interest in buying me and taking me from my home changed their mind because I told them to do so with my thoughts, and with my thoughts alone. 
I even used my thoughts to convince someone to tell Farmer Shelby what a fine horse I was, and that he should keep me with my family. But that little trick didn't work. Farmer Shelby saw right through the ruse. He somehow suspected I was behind his bad luck in selling me, and he gave me such a lashing every night, yelling at me and calling me a dumb, ill-bred, good-for-nothing animal. Eventually, I didn't have the strength to think anymore. He beat it all out of me. I was in so much pain I could barely stand, and all I could think about was not getting lashed again. But that was okay, because I was so bruised and broken up that no one believed I was magnificent, despite the big red sign above my head. I guess it kind of worked out in that way. At least for a little while. But let's move on from that cloudy moment in my life, and come back to it a little later. What I want to say is I'm old now, and I'm stuck in a faraway world that feels like every scary place I've ever heard about all rolled into one. I have definitely lived and seen and experienced things no horse has ever seen, and I'll tell you, Despite all the manure shoveled my way throughout my days, I've only made one or two friends that have made the suffering bearable. And to be sure, it is one such friend who wants to write the story of my life. She believes that what I have been through and what she has been through could someday help someone going through a similar situation. To be honest, I don't know if all this will be helpful. What I do know is I hadn't talked for like an eternity before I met her, and once we started talking, I just couldn't shut my trap. Kind of like an endless geyser. I guess I didn't realize how much I had to say, or how much I had kept bottled inside, or how much I needed to talk, and that talking alone had lifted such a heaviness from my heart that I felt like I could fly. It's great to have a friend especially one who doesn't judge or interrupt and who listens with the heart and not the head. A friend who understands you, believes in you, and who calls you magnificent and means it. Truly means it. I may not know much, but I know this. One good friend makes all the difference. Tales from the Horror, Through the Void Darkly, 2. The fortress tank was littered with burnt cadavers. Twisted limbs reached out like black gnarled trees against the blue light seeping through a hole in the metal ceiling. Scorch marks scarred the floor and on the wall, Haley read, No Exit, written in blood. She stared at the words for a long, pensive moment. Then the squad assembled around her, asking if she could pick up anything with her abilities. She shrugged, and inched closer to the bodies, feeling a strange heaviness in the air. She could sense there was something unnatural and unknown still lingering about the corridor. Cautiously, Haley inched toward a crushed head on the metal grate and froze mid-step when she felt her arms prickle. She let her foot fall slowly and fixed her gaze on the charred eye sockets, searching for something, anything, anything that could help understand what had happened to the previous crew. When nothing appeared, she raised her gaze and started when a ghostly soldier suddenly flashed before her eyes. Composing herself, she watched the soldier scramble down the dark corridor with entrails wiggling out of his lacerated stomach like giant worms. Sam sensed Haley was distraught and asked her what she was seeing. She turned to face him but tumbled backward and gasped at the sudden vision of gas-soaked soldiers going up in flames. The flames erupted and melted fat and flesh like butter until everything dissipated into plumes of swirling blue smoke. Clamoring to her feet, and steadying herself, Haley breathed deeply and turned to the squad with a bleak expression. She said nothing for a long moment. She debated whether she should share her visions with the rest of the squad, 
but she wasn't sure if what she had seen could be trusted. It could have been a memory, or it could have been a hallucination triggered by the void. Finally, she admitted she wasn't sure about what she had seen, and told the squad she needed more time to investigate. So saying, she made her way to a pile of mangled bodies, grabbed a charred hand, and closed her eyes. Silencing her mind, she focused all her senses on the moment, but nothing came to her. The whispers, Jaden said, approaching his stepsister. They've stopped. It's like the tank is somehow shielding us from the outside. Haley opened her eyes and regarded him. Then she released the lifeless hand. If that's true, she said flatly, what happened to them? She gestured toward the scattered bodies with an uneasy sigh. Good question, Natasha commented as she scanned the massive tank for signs of life. Looks like we'll be staying here for a bit. Doesn't bother me. I've been in worse places back home. Speak for yourself, Nat, Jen shook her head. This is a death trap. We should look for another place. What other place? Derek asked. There is no other place. Let's clear the rooms and make this can of hell pleasant. Pleasant? Mel questioned. Am I the only one smelling that? Smelling what? Dwayne smirked. Mel turned to Dwayne. She wanted to smack the glasses off his face for downplaying the stench. What do you mean, smelling what? Barbecued humanity, that's what. Dwayne shrugged. Just breathe through your mouth. Mel shook her head. I don't want to breathe through my mouth. Well, I'm sure Claudine will think of something with her flowers. Very funny, Ash. Claudine's face hardened. I'm not collecting air fresheners here, or are you that clueless? And she shoved Ash, who was laughing, into the hard metal wall with a resonating clang. Knock it off, Mahan snapped. Let's split up. Check the rooms for survivors. See if we can find something useful like medical supplies. The squad agreed, with nods and whispers, and soon dispersed throughout the tank. At this point, Mahan motioned for Haley and Jaden to follow him, as he picked his way through the dark corridor with his flashlight. After what seemed like a lifetime, they found a control room lined with generators that had somehow been grafted to the wall. Nearby, there was a container filled with a strange, bubbling black substance. From the container, a thick red hose extended to the generators. Mahan scrutinized the container, the generators, and the dashboard. It seemed like the black fluid somehow fueled the generators, and the generators somehow powered the fortress. He wasn't exactly sure how this makeshift energy system worked, but he had seen the technology before in other realms. For a moment, he had the faint hope that the generators and the tank had been designed to help them survive the void. They're similar to the other generators, Jaden observed as he passed his finger along the controls until he found a small window covered in grime and other substances he didn't want to think about. Mahan approached a generator and tried to activate it but nothing happened. He removed a panel and tinkered with wires like he had done countless times before. Within moments, the generator sparked, belched, and grumbled to life as a light bulb flickered on and off, casting a soft orange glow in the room. We've got power, Haley smiled. Thanks to... Jaden's words trailed away as the ground shook beneath his feet and a deep sonorous roar came from outside. With a great sense of urgency, he used his sleeve to clear the grime from the window. As he stared out into the void, a shudder ran through him and the blood drained from his face. What is it? Haley asked. When Jaden didn't answer, Mahan turned towards Haley, then Jaden, and asked, What is it? What's out there? Still, he didn't answer. Haley and Mahan exchanged a worried look as the world shook again. Come see this, Jaden finally stammered. His voice came out in a thin croak, and he felt his nerves growing taut as he fought down a surge of panic. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, 
It was unlike anything he had ever seen in the other realms. Staggering and helping one another, Haley and Mahan stepped behind Jaden. All three looked through the small window in open-mouthed disbelief. <laughs>